Top 3% of kids get into these good colleges. What about the 97%? If education was online, can that compete or compare with real life education? I think I've been blessed by not being uh, spoiled with a lot of fundraising. Do you think balance is an important part of being a successful entrepreneur? No. I hate balance. I think balance is a very important part of anything. The opportunity and the way this country is changing yeah. is a once in a century, century or yeah. more. Uh, Bill Gates has started this uh, Windows that has made him a billionaire. And I want to start doors. It's kind of cool. <laughs>
At some point, we found this, and An Academy, in fact, started as a YouTube channel. When I'm you should say a bit about your co-founder. He's like some academically like a, an anomaly of sorts. Yeah, I, I'm getting there. So, we started creating <laughs> videos. Um, I started creating computer science videos, but uh, they didn't get mm. uh, a lot of views. But they got like fifty thousand, sixty thousand views. And then um, I met Roman, and I know each other from school, where we used to go to chemistry tuitions together. and at some point he was in aims uh, he had just become a doctor he was the youngest doctor and then somehow he ended up cracking he was just about to crack the ups exam but the results were not out and the day he cracked i called him up i thought this is a great opportunity i mean he has cracked the examination he has 3 months before he has to go to labasna why not i should get some free videos out of him so it was done as a content project but those videos what were these written. videos about what did you ups preparation because i was making computer science videos they used to get 50000 to 1 lakh views but when his video came we got a million views the channel became one of the biggest channels etc so youtube think, channel yeah um, youtube channel an academy and then next one one and a half years uh, himesh and i my other co-founder we had started this company called flat chat it was like tinder but for finding roommates this i had started when i was in college in nmims uh, i had raised my first angel invest i i in fact got a first angel investment offer when i was in fourth year of college but then i got this software engineering job which was the first job um pretty good job so for me to come from a middle class background and say no to that kind of offer i think it was 16 lakhs per annum back in 2012 um i mean it was too good to refuse and then one year i stayed there i paid off my education loans i had taken an education loan to study in college um and then at some point like you said that i realized i cannot work for somebody else's vision i mean i was too much of a rebel to uh, work for somebody else so then flat chat was started which common floor bought in 2014 that's how i came to bangalore uh, and then i was with common floor for one one and a half years uh, learned how to scale a company flat chat was small it was sold in 10 months uh, so did an academy start like that was it a video channel which became a business yes yes so you started monetizing this channel yes we started monetizing it but when roman went to labasna he was not uh, um i mean he was not allowed to make money mm. so we stopped monetization so, the educational anomaly i was talking about is he became a doctor and then uh, is officer yeah so wow. he did both together yeah that's and then that's lovely and then you know there was this one one and a half years of convincing we would talk every night it was clear that both of us would talk figure out a way to convince his parents on how uh, he should leave is etc and when did an academy become all that it is in terms of scale the same question i asked him when did you realize an academy is big no so we had that uh, intrinsic optimism mm. that we have to make this big mm. i mean one guy is he was the assistant collector of jabalpur i mean he is leaving that uh and then um you know we 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 knew that this is all, we are going all in mm. like working 16 hours a day 7 days a week we we had to go all in and we had to make it big mm. the question wasn't so see people don't realize a lot of times we went through at least 10 pivots mm. before we realized our business model in 2019 mm. so 2015 is when we started the company when roman quit when himesh quit when i quit both of himesh and i quit common floor roman quit is Four years it took us ten plus pivots to realize what's our business model. But once we cracked the business model, this is I remember 2019. Uh, we were on a founders retreat, um, and we we start seeing revenue numbers that we are doing 30 lakhs a day, 40 lakhs a day, and this is the first time we had seen revenue PMF. We had seen views PMF. We were creating content, so we we had seen that journey that our videos were doing 100 million views a month. Mm. So that journey we had already seen. but when we started seeing revenue pn pmf that's when we knew we had hit something but it took us at least 4 years plus 10 pivots to get there would you like to go next yeah sure <laughs> uh proud of having a very low middle class upbringing uh keeps your feet on the ground mm-hmm. and i think i'm around because i've kept my feet on the ground most of my life that's why i'm i'm still walking around the place i think it's very important um i had a great first innings and a lot of fun um by seeking out and being an entrepreneur but in a way in so which so we don't know how you started off where did you grow up 
grew up in Mumbai. In Where did you go to school? <coughs> Sorry? Where did you go to school? I went to school in a place called Dunn's Institute. Okay. Okay. What did your parents do? Uh, my dad has been a professional. He worked with the Tata Group for a long time. Mm. And I think before he retired, he spent about 10 years with a, a UK company called J.L. Morrison that made Nivea Cream. Mm -hmm. And my dad's, uh, my brother's <coughs> a PhD in HR. And then I don't know, at my young age, figured out that I may not be that good implementing somebody else's vision. Mm -hmm. So felt <coughs> I need to just start off and do something on my own. Um, and that was when I had to decide whether I want to do an MBA. How old were um, you? Uh, 1920. Mm. And I think at that and stage... what year was this? Hmm, good question. It's about 78, <coughs> 1978. Okay, so I don't know whether that's got a validity stamp today. <laughs> In relevance to everyone, since everyone had a lot of uh, raised eyebrows here. But, um, yeah, it was an excellent crossroad to... Very clear learning lessons for me at that early stage. Mm. <coughs> One is when my dad said, okay, I don't really figure out what you want to do, but why don't you do your MBA, do your child accountancy, and then if you want to still mm. run something on your own, start mm. that way. And I was quite clear that if I had a plan B in my life, then plan A wouldn't work out. Mm. Because I think that's half the situation, right? When you want to start something and you feel you have an optionality, you're going to run aground definitely 10 times. And I think the other thing that both my parents told me is, look, if you're going to do that, we don't have the wherewithal to bail you out. So we'll, you'll have all our love and all our affection, but we're not going to bail you out. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good, good segue to start off mm -hmm. at a time when there was no angel or VC funding. So what did you start first? Um, I started a cable TV company mm -hmm. that started wiring up all of Mumbai mm -hmm. and most of the five-star hotels. Mm -hmm. That was a time when uh, the TV sets didn't have a remote control. So not only did we have to start selling the concept to people, but we also had to sell concepts to the TV manufacturers to start making multi-channel TV sets at that particular point in time. So that was my, I think, first sojourn into starting something. And then? When was the big moment where... There's never been a big moment. I think big moments are oh. overplayed in life. Okay, when did Ronnie Screwala become Ronnie Screwala to people who don't know you? Who didn't know you personally? When did you become a figure per se? Yeah, so I don't know what that criterion because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> so I don't think any one person <laughs> de defines where the other one is. But it's I think media, the mass. But media is a profile mm. that gets you somewhere. So I think... Early media days, mm -hmm. then later media days, and then I think when we morphed to be. Okay, you started cable. Yeah. Did very well in cable? Five years, then sold it. How much do you sell it for? Literally nothing. It, I think that's the stage where it was getting quite messy. There were a lot of copyright issues, and mm -hmm. I just felt that was not my DNA mm -hmm. to build a business that would have so many challenges at that very early stage in life. Okay. So it was a chance when my, the, the COO that I had appointed. Mm -hmm came in and resigned and said, I'm going to go to a South Indian party who wants to start cable TV. Mm. So I said, well, will you check with them whether they want to buy this because then you can buy it, run it and go mm. forward. That's pretty much our So did you place. use the corpus from selling the cable business to start the media stuff? So media, I think, again, is serendipity mm. in many ways, right? Because um, as coming from the lower middle class home, mm. I think I... Since I hadn't studied, for me, learning soft skills was an important element. So instead of doing boxing and football in school, I did elocution, debates, dramatics, theater, mm -hmm. and front of camera hosting at that particular point and in time. And what did you do in media first? So literally, that it was pretty much that. And I think the first thing that happened is there was an advertising agency called Lintas Low mm -hmm. and Alec Padamsi, who used to yeah. do a lot of theater with, I used to do a lot of theater with. So he came in one fine day and said, you know, Hindustan Levers wants to do India's first sponsored program. Mm. And that's pretty much how the company was born. And he said, we've got to make 13 episodes of a TV show. Do you want to make it? And I said, oh, why are you coming to me? He says, you just mm. look like the guy who's going to be able to put it all together. Mm. And I think that's how the media part started. And that led to movies and UTV. Movies much later, mm. I think. Didn't have funding for almost six, seven years. Mm. When you don't have funding, you build a B2B model. Mm. So we were a cost plus model for everything else. We started making TV content. Right. 
and doing lots of stuff. Mm. And that's when I realized for the first time to get in private equity, get external investors. Mm. And then media started getting defined mm. almost 10 years later into the mm. business. So I'd say it was good fun being in the formative part of it. And I think that's what I thrive on. Right. And how did media lead to movies, lead to upgrade, startup investments and all the other things that you do? So media stayed as media. I think the day I realized that if I want to build something at scale mm. and build a brand, then you needed to be in the B2C part of the business. Mm. So I think over a period of two years, I remember one investor call because we had just gone public. Mm. And predictability and margins came into the picture. And I said, actually, I'm not so much in control of what I'm doing because I'm a B2B mm. model. Mm. So we morphed when we started being a broadcaster of about 10 channels. And then started a movie studio. The first five movies we made were disasters in every sense of the word. Mm. And most people would say, why are you ever in that mm. business kind of situation? Why are you in that business? Because I needed to build a B2C brand. Mm. And you can't build a B2C brand in media mm. if you're not in the big screen part of it. Mm. And what was and the I, need to build the brand? Uh, like Just for me, I think I was starting to get obsessed with scale. Okay, scale. And I think value. Like if you see, there are about 30, 40 companies in media that have got mm. listed since the time we did that. Right. And I think if you look at their market cap for the last 20, 25 years, they haven't moved more than 10% cumulatively in the last 25 years. Mm. So my realization to unlock and create value mm. was to build an integrated model versus being a pure play. And at that stage, I think for six, seven years, I got slaughtered by everyone saying, where's your focus? Mm. Why are you not only into one single aspect? Mm. Then you get competitor reviews from different people. Uh, but I think... Normally, when you're going against the grain and you know it, means when a lot of people think they've not understood your model, I've found that that's normally where 10x, 10x, or 20x value gets created. So do you think these still hold true? Like B2C is where value can really be created, even today? A B2C business today? You're saying in, in media specifically? Not, not in media, in anything. Yeah, it's a tougher one. So mm. I think when one got into education mm. and one got into learning, mm. The first crossroad was whether we should start B2B mm. because it's a tricky business, right? right? In a sense, it's education is a very formatted, formal world in every sense of the word. Everyone's very predictable. Uh, it's a calendared event in your life, so mm -hmm. to speak. And to break that up and say, I want to build something, we could have easily started the B2B way, but I was quite clear we should start B2C. And that was a tougher, tougher model to go. Mm. But I think no regrets in the last six years. And the second thing, do you often make more money by being counter trend? I think I'd, I'd answer that maybe two ways. I think um, my ratio of eight failures to two successes is something that I've hold on to mm. quite well. Mm. It's not that I go out to do it in that. It's not a formula. But I think when, you're, when you fail as often as you do, mm. that's a minus one X every time. It could be a mm. big minus one X. It could be a Minus 1x, $10 million, $100 million, a bad hire, a bad decision, mm. pulling the plug on a business, sticking with a business, whatever else. But it's a minus 1x. Mm. But because you've done that, when you do get a success, it's 30x, 40x. Mm. And I think that if you don't have that law of averages working, the chances of you having success will be 2x, 3x, 4x, which is still fantastic. But that 30x, 40x doesn't come about unless there's a lot that you've done, which is... Mm. where your mind has allowed your instinct and your gut to really get a little bit more polished, to just feel confident. Because at the end of the day, it's not about gut, right? It's a lot to do with your own self-conviction. Mm. When everything Explain. else fails. Self-confliction being? Self-conviction. Conviction being? Yeah, I think that at the end of the day, if I have to say, mm. what do I have as the reservoir? It's the self-conviction, right? Mm. Because how do you get out of failure? Self-conviction. Is that conviction in yourself or conviction in the cyclical nature of a sector that you're betting on? Has to be in yourself. Has to be in yourself. Yeah, I don't think anyone can have such conviction in a cyclical part of a business mm. or even in a sector. Mm. Yeah. And how does Ronnie spend time today? Like how much time does which business take up? So I'm not a I'm not very big at breaking up yeah. time. I think the elasticity mm. I think I've been blessed with um, keeping my feet on the ground most of the time. Mm. I think I've been blessed by not being uh, spoiled with 
a lot of fundraising mm. from time to time, which I think <laughs> really corrupts mm. people and corrupts right. minds and corrupts businesses and right. corrupts many other things. But I've also been most blessed that I enjoy everything that I've done. Right. So I think my media part to do that mm. uh, and the level at which you do it, and I think what I'm doing right now, whether it's our not-for-profit mm. foundation mm. or whether it's going back and doing a little bit of storytelling in the movies, mostly with the skilling and workforce development and learning platform mm. um, that we're trying to build mm -hmm. globally. And a little bit having fun with um, sports teams like mm. the Kabaddi one. You where both have a sports team, right? In the we same have, league. We both have two uh, sports teams technically. Yeah. Because we Kabaddi? also own table tennis. Table yeah. tennis. It's a small, that's a smaller mm. property, but still fun. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys ever like, I mean, I know you don't play Kabaddi. I'm hoping the answer is that. Like, but table tennis, you must enjoy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Have you tried Kabaddi? Kabaddi for me huh. would go back a long time, right. right? Jay is young, Jay can still... I mean, unfortunately not young enough. Uh, <laughs> I've played a little bit. Right. But that's more just after the team happened and then trying to, mm. you know, see what it is. Are they, are they nice to you and don't really go hard on you because you're their boss? They, th thankfully, yes. <laughs> because uh, it is a rough sport. Yeah. And, and I don't think I appreciate how rough it is. Yeah. Till you know we till you get out there on the get out there and you realize it's <coughs> it's an incredible game. Yeah, I think we both have really bonded and spent lots of time together. Would you? But, but that's a good example of what you just asked of how do you take and build a brand on mm -hmm. something, right? Because if you take that game, it's it's always been a great game, especially right. from an Indian sport mm -hmm. point of view. But to take it out of the sort of mutti and put it on a mat right. and put some lights on them. Mm. And then just one or two tweaks to the rules of the mm. game where every third time you have to score mm. versus you can just come in and go out and not score mm. has changed the entire perception. Just those two factors have taken popularity of a sport from X to yeah. 10X, 20X. No, I'm intrigued. The last time Jay was in town, he had come for a Kabaddi game. Yep. So we were talking about it. And it seems like the learning curve or or the amount of money you need to set up a kabaddi game is not as high as many other sports yeah you don't need a stadium like cricket and yeah. football and if you're close to the action it it does i i see the appeal at some level yeah I mean, in India, sports is quite different. Uh -huh. There, if you in the US, you need to own a stadium, you need to own the infrastructure here. You don't need mm -hmm. necessarily, even in cricket, to necessarily own the venue. Mm -hmm. And they're normally quite segregated. But yeah, I think... The Have these teams become profit-making now? Yes, but it depends on how you account for it in terms of allocated cost and how much non-discretionary spend you are doing in terms of are you building a youth program? Are you doing scouting? Are you investing in building any physical infrastructure. Mm. So maybe uh, also Ronnie is in uh, Mumbai, I'm in Pune. His fixed cost tends to be a little higher. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But right now, I think we are all having <laughs> more fun mm. than the monetary gains mm. from it, I would yeah. say. Mm. I agree. Would you like to go next, Jay? Tell us yeah. about yourself. Yeah, sure. So first, uh, fun to learn, Ronnie, about you before I knew you because I only knew you from 2014. I only know the later stage of uh, Ronnie and I echo a lot of the things that he said like resonated with me. Uh, middle class values, feeling older. Uh, now I'm meeting and interviewing people born in 2001. Mm. And How old are you now, Jay? I'm 89, so I'm 33. So you're the youngest one. How yeah. old are you, Gaurav? Uh, I'm 90 born. Oh, wow. Also, I'm older game. than both of you then. Okay, yeah. come on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll have to just act young. <laughs> <laughs> but we, but both, we both were born on the same date. But considering you went to MBA or whatever around 78, you don't look your age. Right. No. Or oh, didn't do my MBA, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. No. I agree. I, would have, I thought yeah. you were younger. Yeah. Um, yeah, I grew up in Mumbai. Middle class values... Uh, quite sheltered and dad uh, founded Kotak and I've been you know privileged to watch him and uh, the business grow and that's been a great learning experience for me. I went to the US for my studies and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do with my life professionally, where when I wanted to go. When did Kotak become big in your own journey? Uh, Were you in school? I. It depends on big 
in terms of the size of the business or our perception of it from not your perception of it but our perception of it when uh, did that happen i think we became a large capital markets and non bank franchise in the early 2000s so about 20 years ago yes i would say that. and the bank came later kotak was founded in the late 80s and the bank uh, happened in the early 2000s around 2001 2002 So the capital markets business the securities business investment banking was much more mature but we only became a big b2c brand where people normal people had debit cards credit cards bank accounts uh in the late 2000s but i did not perceive or understand mm. how large the business had become really till i came back from undergrad in the us in 2012 2011 2012 even then i never actually worked at kotak till I came back from my MBA and I wasn't really sure that you know this was my calling but um when I was taking that decision you know 3 weeks before I was going to graduate I was evaluating hey do I want to stay in the US it's a pretty comfortable life work at a private equity fund or an investment bank or a tech company there or do I want to come back and my father actually called me and rare that he would do something like this and he mm-hmm. said I really do think uh you should come back for India not as much necessarily for Kotak because the opportunity and the way this country is changing yeah. is a once in a century century or yeah. more if you think over the last 5 or 6 centuries this has only happened 6 or 7 times and yeah. um that I kind of took that plunge, and I'm 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 glad I did. Where did you go to college? I went to undergrad at. Like him, like tell us where you went to school, when you went sure. out. I went to school at uh, Cathedral and John Connon School in Mumbai, and then went to college to Columbia mm-hmm. in New York. Came back, worked for a few years, mostly uh, consulting, investment banking, not at Kotak, and then went to business school. I did my MBA at Harvard in Boston. I graduated 2017 and since then I've been in India and I actually after MBA joined Kotak spent couple of years doing capital markets which was the original kind of uh strength and you know original business mm-hmm. of the Kotak group and then I've moved into consumer and B2C ever mm-hmm. since I remember meeting him mm-hmm. meeting up with you in Boston in your last 2 3 months of how at this thing and i remember having that breakfast conversation with you and you were still debating on india or not india yeah and yeah. glad your dad convinced you or you were on the same page yeah you were on the same page. i'm glad it's best best decision not just for me but for anybody my generation and i'm seeing a lot of people coming back lot of people coming back it's a very interesting train of thought right like go back in time is patriotism defined by arbitrary boundaries drawn at one point of time i would i would also like you know put a caveat in here and say some countries are more patriotic than us like i feel like america does a amazing job of selling patriotism no wait wait so that's a soft power approach mm. I mean, we should not mix that up and i'm mm. glad you brought that up mm. there right because obviously that's a soft power approach where mm. it's only the view from one particular side and point mm. of view so yeah they've done a remarkable one sided job mm. on soft power mm. okay where you can make a movie about an assassin that mm. shot 123 so uh, people mm. in a country they went and occupied mm. but if the other person had done it from the other side mm. you're not going to see a hollywood movie on that right so whether you can call it sniper or you can call it X Y Z, uh, but they've done a great job. Is there a, is there a correlation between how many patriotic movies are made to yeah, the underlying patriotism power, in the country? Soft power for America in every sense of the word. I mean, there's your Silicon Valley and there's your technology, mm. and then mm. there's Hollywood. And yeah, I think I think I would say cricket and Bollywood for India are very internal, insulated mm. soft powers. The mm. problem is the soft power is. how you get perceived from the outside right and mm-hmm. here now everyone stop playing cricket 90% of the revenues come from cricket in india mm-hmm. because nobody else is playing cricket all the commonwealth countries are playing more football they mm-hmm. do play cricket mm-hmm. but not to that level and i think the same applies to storytelling i think are we missed that bus on being a global ambassador from mm-hmm. storytelling yeah do you think because you both have a birds eye view on kabaddi do you see cricket losing 
the kind of viewership with the newer generations than it did in maybe for maybe people in their 30s and 40s I, what about the youngsters i don't think so i think there is enough space in mm-hmm. india for multiple sports to coexist and i think cricket is around to stay you can never say forever if you look at a sport like baseball for example in the us it is on a steady kind of declining trend but the us still has four major sports mm. and they are, for me it's more about the fact that they emphasize different elements of human skill mm. you think about a baseball that's a little more like cricket mm-hmm. a basketball that is about a height mm. reflexes you know uh, endurance intensity mm. american football you'll often see some of those footballers are fat you know uh, and there's a whole host of uh, different skill sets on uh, uh, football field the act of going to a football game is like an all day event two hours from the city as opposed to a basketball game which is like going to a movie i see the same kind of thing manifesting itself uh, mm. in india same thing in the uk with rugby cricket mm. football kabaddi is very different from cricket mm. in the kind of elements of human skill that it emphasizes and it's a very different viewership proposition it's a shorter game it's a 40 minute game it's a very high intensity 30 second uh piece and i think that's what makes it exciting and you can go for a kabaddi game as a family mm. like you would for a movie in the mm. evening see it and come back right can, can i ask answer? you guys a very interesting question digress a little bit like when all three of you spoke about your life your journeys uh you brought up the middle class upbringing the middle class values i'm also from a middle class family right uh do you think we do this subconsciously to signal the perception of us we want to be known we want others to know us for because yeah. we have a little bit of imposter yeah. complex it's important it yeah. yeah we do i i would say yes but it's important part of the narrative right because your is your, it is it a truly important part of the narrative of why the three of you are successful or is it an important part of justifying the narrative well two parts to that one is it's important to be part of the narrative because you asked the question because we're sitting here having a conversation mm-hmm. which we are assuming other people who want to gleam out of and therefore mm-hmm. the context is important and second yes i do genuinely believe that the grounding mm-hmm. that one got and i think when i listened to what mm-hmm. jay said mm-hmm. that there's a there's a grounding that you get so i think it's important to refer to that and you're not saying it mm-hmm. so that you can say look once upon a time i was here and now i'm here i don't think that's the context but can i also ask you a question who does not want to imbibe middle class values on their kids like i would think most wealthy people in the world are trying to teach their kids middle class va- values in one way or another so how are we unique or how is that unique in each of your own journeys Well, I'd, that, I'd pivot it out the other way because uh, who doesn't is a very small minority of who doesn't mm. because you're talking about it with the top angle view. Right. I think mm-hmm. we're all looking at it from the bottom, <laughs> the bottom angle view. Yeah. And in the right. bottom angle view, it's right. aspirational. Right. The top angle view of who doesn't is a thin what minority. Is, what is aspirational though? Having middle class values or being successful? No, the, the journey. Mm. The journey is the success. No, so the and story and works. works. And, and more than the perception, I think it's also about the fact that I think a lot of initial drive comes from mm. the fact that like like from the fact that you see other people having so much mm. and you want that. Now mm. I was reading this book called Hard Drive which is Bill Gates biography and now he he was born into money not like mm. the kind of money he eventually got but he still had that passion for one thing. Mm. But you know it is you know I used to see let's say uh my father's friends who mm. were other doctors mm. and the kind of cars they would have or the kind of you mm. know parties they would have etc and see it's it's not perception like so you, is that the innate emotion which made you as hungry and ambitious in life initially two innate emotions one this and second all my friends because that is a very raw true emotion right somebody else has more than you humans yeah, were mean, never altruistic i mean my father had a maruti 800 and my chachu had a zen mm. and It's so following think, that journey where are you now like you have x what do you compare yourself to and no now i don't see mm. at some point it's a now see drive is not black or white mm. it's not like because i wanted a better car i i work 16 hours a day i could have if i wanted to make money i could have chosen another profession mm. where i would work 8 hours a day and have a much more work life balance but i don't have that so i think i think initial drive or for example when i was in school 
all of my friends, I went to Xavier's Jaipur, which is one of the best schools in Jaipur, but all of my friends got into IITs. I didn't. So then during college, that was the second part of the drive that I had was that, you know, there was this hunger to prove that, you know, and every time, at that time, it was this Gmail group and, you know, you had Gtalk or something like that and we would discuss Gchat. that. Gchat. Gchat. Sorry. Um, mm. uh, it's very surprising. They should have been the one to been break out and done. Yeah. 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 Do you think balance is an important part of being a successful entrepreneur? No. I hate balance. I think you have yeah, to be in... I think balance is a very important part of anything. Balance, tolerance, little bit, you know. Balance, tolerance, completely different. Balance Yeah, of course it's different. I'm, I was adding to that, this thing. Uh, but what yeah, do you balance mean by balance? Balance is very important. Do you mean balance in temperament? Do you mean balance in skill set? No, neither. I mean balance in the repetitive nature of life. Let's say he has a family. Let's say you have a family. Do you allocate 10 hours to work, one day a weekend... Do you do, do you have a hobby? Do you go to the gym? Do you take care of your health? I mean, balance in that way. Hmm. So uh, I'll, I'll go first. I, I have always lived a life to a point. Now I'm focusing on health. But I have been a fan of this notion that uh, if you have to be truly, truly big and if you have to create something that impacts, creates a huge impact, I hate balance. Um, hmm. I mean, I believe that you do enough so that it's utility. Mm. Uh, you you figure out a way to balance family, health, etc. But you have to go all in. If if you have to create something truly, truly, truly big, mm. uh, if you have to create something very good, it's fine. I think balance is fine. See, so maybe that's the generation gap I would yeah. miss. I, I feel here, mm. and I might. You agree with him? No, I I I think if I look at eighty years of life, mm. I want balance mm. in that eighty year journey. And I very much agree with you on, on that piece. I agree with you, Gaurav, that say for a two, three, five year period, it may not be consecutive here and there. If you feel something about a certain way, if you feel like you're creating something, you're having an exciting time, whether it be professionally, personally, anything, then go all in on that. But the sine curve has to kind of... Which yeah. phase, which cycle are you in right now? I'm right now in the... Actually, I'm in the middle of cycles. I would say the last three years has been a lot of uh, drill down work mm. and all work related. Mm. But now uh, I'm getting married this year. So I think that is going to necessitate some mm. changes. Tell, tell them balance. a story about your... Okay, yeah. let me do like half of it and you can do no. the finishing part of it. Nikhil's been waiting to set this up. <laughs> No, I'm happy it worked out the way it did. So one day me and Jay go out for a meal in Bombay. We go for dinner. Where did we go? Uh, I met you at Mekong at Land's End. Yeah, not Mekong. Not Mekong. We were what sitting the, on that uh, lobby place. Huh, but, but, we, but I saw you at, at, at the, there's a, there's a Chinese Correct. restaurant at Land's End. Japanese then we, or Chinese. And then we had coffee yeah. uh, at the... Yeah. Uh, like cafeteria yeah. Yeah. Uh, bistro oh, ironic by the way the food plays a very important part in all our yeah. lives when we look yeah, at yeah, but the food Chinese there is really yeah. good huh? yeah. like really yeah. good food yeah. yeah so we went from there we met one or two other friends of mine we went yeah. to some place near BKC no near uh, Kamla Mills it was a lot we went to a couple of places then we went you tell the story okay, we went yeah. to a couple of places we yeah. were basically going from one place to another yeah. random we're weekend we're moving from food now to love so yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes so random weekend in Bombay the last place we went to is a friend of mine, his house. And uh, so me and Jay, uh, Jay went there and we were sitting uh, and we were chatting and stuff like that. We were playing chess. We were playing chess. We were playing chess. And there happened to be a girl in my friend's house. Yeah. Okay. Cut to, like Jay meets her there. They yeah. talk for five minutes. In front of me, they don't even exchange numbers. Yeah. Uh, cut to like a few months later, Jay's in Bangalore and uh, we're having dinner at home. And he's like, bro, I started dating that girl. Yeah. And that is the girl he's getting married to now in November. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, they should name their no child. No there, but, but <laughs> phenomenal. and Lovely. That's great. Uh, her name is Aditi. Super story. And it was a butterfly effect mm -hmm. in, you know, I was tired that day. I had finished 
a very close friend of mine got married. So we had his barat, his uh, wedding. It was an early wedding. And we finished by around 6.37 and Nikhil was in town that day. And somewhere or the other, I said, you know, okay, I'll spend half an hour with Nikhil and you know, then go home and sleep because I'm tired. And we had fun and it just became five hours. And as you rightly said, at the end of that night, I must have spent two minutes with Aditi. And the only thing we got out of that conversation was, hey, I did my MBA in the US. And she was saying, I'm applying right now for my MBA in the US. So I will for, you know, I rarely thank my Harvard MBA, but I will uh, <laughs> do, it, do it in this case because that was something that uh, is always a good thing to say. Yeah. Uh, and then we just kept in touch on Instagram. Really? Yeah. Who messaged who first? Uh, she's going to watch this and all like. So I know I'm, she's, <laughs> going, she's going to kill me. Uh, I follow requested her. Mm. She accepted my follow request mm. and followed me back. Mm. And she has many more followers than me. So uh, I, will, I felt like, okay, you know, she probably gets hundreds or not thousands of. Uh, you were still on the MBA yeah. uh, wavelength at yes. that time. <laughs> Uh, How know, long has it been now? It's been uh, January 2021. So it's a little over two years. years. And uh, it just went from mm. chatting on Instagram to, hey, when are you in Mumbai next? You know, let's meet. Very interesting. And Congratulations on the wedding in November. So Thank you. I thought this group would be very interesting. Uh, we have one very savvy investor come entrepreneur come has done everything in life from producing movies to media. Uh, and how do you define savviness? Because I think savviness is a, it's, a, it, in, you get a, you, it's a nomenclature that in, you get into sometimes. In the but. world that we live in today, my benchmark, my metric is capitalism. And through those lens, historically, looking at your track record, you're very savvy. Fair? Uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, <laughs> so I'll accept it from that in point of view. For capitalism sure. kind of removes the beauty in the eye of the beholder argument because we're all viewing from similar lens. Yeah, but just to complete that off and to what maybe Gaurav said yeah. earlier, I can't visualize ever what I was getting turned off of who drove what mm. car. Yeah. yeah, I think for me. Are you bad at taking compliments generally in life? I just, sorry? Like, are you bad at taking compliments in life generally? Yeah, maybe because I Because that's subconsciously yeah. Yeah. a trigger to something else. Why do you think that is? My that's, own self-conviction, maybe. I'm, I mean, I don't know. Self-conviction would help you take a compliment. I was trying to, f I think my, I think you're very right and very intuitive on that. Maybe I'll, I'll take it one level forward that I was trying to fine tune it even more further mm. by actually going to the fact that to me, enjoying myself has, mm. been, has been one of the higher parts of mm. it. Because actually I'm quite a loner in many ways. I, I, I work most of the work of companies that one has built has been very interactive with people, mm. but still in that sense. But I think for me, the benchmark of really just enjoying what you do has been very, very critical and important. And I think my journey has been a little bit of that. Okay. When you do that, you feel blessed. When you feel blessed, you get recharged. When you get recharged, you do a lot more. Mm. So in a way, you're saying contradiction in your mind is lesser because you have found something you love. Yeah, I mean, contradiction on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And balance, I understand where God was talking about, where, where you need to, I think what he's saying is you need to be rebellious, you need to be out of your box. You need With Gaurav, what I mind. also feel is it feels like he is so ambitious, like he thinks it's good to be capitalistic, but somewhere he also feels it's a good thing to be poor. No, but it's I a good thing to be? Poor. Why? Because that's your gut, you know, like, See, when you're talking about a smaller unit, right? We grow up in families with four people, five people, six people. Families are always socialistic in nature, where everything is shared. When you go out in the world and things become capitalism and inequality increases disproportionately, some part of our subconscious, I believe, because so much of what we are today is a, is a factor of our upbringing, our influences, I think some part of each of us believe, not directly, but subconsciously, that it is good to be poor. And I think the more you win in capitalism, the more you feel like that at a subconscious level. No, no. I might be wrong. No, no. That was, see, that was at the end of the day, 
one of the initial drives that has not been my drive in a long time mm. i don't today i wouldn't compare that he has this or she has this or something like that that was just an initial part of the drive eventually you know whether it's product or content i found that thing which motivated me and i think um but, i i, but I think book. you're addicted to being rebellious <laughs> maybe i know you five like whatever 30 minutes and i definitely see some spunk yeah which is a good thing yeah yeah i mean in a nice manner but it, you're addicted to that i mean you know half the times i would say oh i mean and now maybe a little bit i follow you because we met couple of times i'm saying now why does he have to shoot his my mouth off again <laughs> but i think you enjoy it and that's that defines the so, character so, so, so for us i mean for us it was the fact that who has made it big in the venture capital game and and to be tagged as a unicorn i mean when we were 25 years old me roman and himesh one of the goals was that you know if we can make a unicorn before 30 that would be awesome and it did happen meaning convince four or five people to give you a lot of money at a higher value but that was that's what it would mean right but unlike some other companies our company has also created value so yeah but essentially yeah, yeah. that yeah, I'm, essentially, i'm i'm just i'm just I'm just curious about that. I'm I'm not I'm not I'm 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 very happy with my lunch or but I'm I'm trying to because I think it's the messaging that we all do in a conversation is very important. No no so I get it. I mean if I were to look and back And I'm half chaving you so don't get me wrong. <laughs> if if I were to look back should I have chased valuation the way I did? Probably not. But it did teach me a lot of things and at some point you know an academy in the last 12 months the way we have focused on EBITDA I think very few venture funded companies have and this month will be the first month where we we are cash flow positive so I think that journey wasn't easy but uh, that's a hardcore capitalistic talk now but one thing i have to add in gorov's defense is what he's saying that valuation game he was not the only one playing it oh, there no. were like millions of people who wanted to achieve what he achieved so regardless of market cycles and when yeah. money drains out and interest rates go up i think a lot of credit goes to him for having been able to get that money scale an academy in the manner that he did and i think he should take pride in that and always yeah no i, I would i would be a little humble here and say that um, there was only one feedback that shailendra and dipinder and bhavan these three people are have been good mentors and they have built companies they have helped build companies they kept saying that don't let your ego come in between mm. so i just i was just i accepted the reality but there were 10 people who told me what to do so i just didn't let it get into my head that or oh, just because i like i could convince five people to value me at a certain valuation doesn't and and by the way this happens with a lot of other founders um rest how to execute or you know how to do that etc i think that was the easy part but listening and having that acceptance that you fucked up or you overhired people uh, and the journey of letting go of people would be a tough one so i think doing that acceptance was the major part uh, once you accept that hey i did i fucked up there are 10 people who will tell you you have to reduce your fixed cost you have to reduce your snm you have to reduce your gna mm. and then uh, and and then we probably yeah. did that. but that's all that matters bro as long as you guys have course corrected in a direction that will make you bigger better stronger in the future i mean see at the end of the day we all wish each other the best right and yeah 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 so where i was at before this conversation is we have one very very savvy person because he has done so many things we have a very articulate friend of mine jay who has gone to the best colleges in the world and gotten great marks and not really how much did you get i was no, always no, 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 no. <laughs> how did you how did you get into harvard i, I was a good student yeah uh, i was a very good student mm. but i was not uh, i was in, always in the top 10% not in the top 1% in all of my classes all See that's through. the benchmark that you come up with not in the top 10% <laughs> but not, uh, no but know. in typically you know there is this kind of culture in india that like you have to have 99 or 98 mm. and i was always 89 90 uh kind of which is good and then we have another engineer who has done so well and you have me who has not gone to college is fairly illiterate from the traditional lens so putting four people like us together right like one who doesn't have any education one harvard one like 
so much experience and so many other but things. Also with also, very little education. But you went to college, you said. I did my BCom, and that uh, was it. Yeah. So you're saying that's that qualifies that's four, bigger that's four time, right? four years more than I did. <laughs> and I thought if we all come together and we talk about education overall, hmm. not just for everybody looking to build a product, a company in education, uh, any kind of a business ancillary to education, I thought four diverse views like this should help an entrepreneur starting off today. So that's the intent of today. And uh, it's not about our individual companies. Yeah. It's not about how well Anna Academy is doing or Upgrad is doing or Kotak Bank is doing. Uh, Kotak Kotak Bank, Bank is is in another level where I don't Completely. think I, 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 don't, I don't, don't think we should no, be no. commenting about it. Yeah. Kotak Bank is not. So I can't take a remote credit for that. I'll only take credit for a little bit of Kotak 811 inside Kotak Bank. Kotak Bank is Could, not. Will you elaborate on that a little bit? Because we'd like to know what Jay is doing at 811. Hmm. Uh, okay. what, what is 811? Uh, 811 stands for, interestingly, given the news that happened yesterday, 8th of November, uh, which was the date of demonetization, where we as a traditional slash legacy bank uh, started a immediate online account opening, which was never allowed before that. Along with demonetization, uh, a set of new interesting and very progressive regulation came that allowed bank accounts to be opened for the first time without a wet signature. So Kotak started a product called Kotak 811 that basically allowed that to happen and, and it saw extremely high uptake because it turns out that a lot of India was and to a lesser extent still is not banked or underbanked and that has been a journey and recently we've Seeing the scale of that opportunity, we've, uh, in a management segregation, not a legal entity segregation, very important because regulatory businesses, I have to be, uh, carved it out uh, as a bank in bank management segregation. And we think of ourselves a little more as a digital bank slash fintech, but, you know, fully regulated um, business. That's nice. Of, and you took that eight. I mean, it's 811, but you call it 811. We call it, so it's yeah. Kotak 811. And 911, they couldn't have called it 911, otherwise it would have been the emergency exactly. number in, in America, right? But it turns so out that most people in India have no no concept of tell what us, 911 tell is. Tell us what 811 does broadly, like if uh, you had to categorize it in a bucket. You can open a bank account in three minutes, sitting mm -hmm. in your living room on your phone. It's a partial KYC account, and you get a virtual debit card. You can start transacting immediately. So element one of the proposition is that it's, uh, fully, you know, straight through. We do around uh, 6 lakh accounts a month. So give or take 20,000 odd a day, which is considerable. So 811 now contributes 70, 70 to 75% of the total accounts that Kotak opens. Uh, and that's just the, the power of digital and why I'm in Bangalore so much. The second element of the value proposition is that we are an unbundled offering. Think of it like how Indigo disrupted Jet Airways. We are zero balance. We are the only large bank in India to offer a bank account with zero minimum balance, which is very compelling for most of India that does not have 10,000 rupees. So would you put. like summarize and say it is banking focused on the young in a fast, efficient, near zero cost manner? Yes, I guess that's a good, good way to summarize it. The one thing I have to add, like, you know, especially for a very underbanked yeah, nation. Yeah, the one thing I have to add about Jay is before the story about him meeting his now-to-be wife and all of that, the very first time I met Jay is when I had gone to the Kotak Bank office where Jay was sitting and pitched their family a product which would a product of ours which would manage a part of their money. And this was a few years before that. And uh, I will say this about Jay, right? A lot of people look at people who are popular personalities, kids, and make up preconceived notions in their mind. Uh, but Jay was refreshingly different. He is not somebody's son alone, but Jay on his own is extremely impressive. Uh, like for the, for the first, I don't know how many times we met, he would never even like mention his dad once or, you know, 
that he's the son of this person, he owns this bank and all of that. And I hope personally, because we have a relationship and you know, whatever, I hope that one day when that opportunity comes, uh, I hope that opportunity comes to lead Kotak Bank. But I can't think of somebody who has more, you know, natural ability. He's so calm, stable, uh, has so many facets which would serve well in leading an institution of that size. Yep, couldn't so agree co- with you, ma'am. Yeah. So I appreciate that, but... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, now he's going to... Humility as well, I missed that. No, I think he's going to pull the regulator and the no, regulation. No, no, no. It's, not, it's not just about regulation. It's, it's, it's a large business. Mm. We are 26% shareholder. Yeah. There are 74 other. And uh, leadership and future has to be decided in the context of what is best for all. I am committed in what I'm doing right now. And of course, by virtue of being... Uh, the largest shareholder, we are aligned with the future of the business. But for me, I don't see that as a necessary So do you think he's not future. taking compliments well either, like you no. asked me? <laughs> no, I, I, I think this is, he's taking it better than you, I must say. Okay. Because you have like this aversion where you rejected blanket. But he's trying to like, you know, incorporate another facet. He's adding to it. No, yeah. I don't agree with a lot of your compliments because I do think that... Uh, this is the best compliment of them all. No, the no, fact no. that you're not agreeing with my compliment. It's having a head start mm. from being born in what was, when I was much younger, I was, you know, we were not very affluent, but still, you know, privileged uh, mm. parents that value your education, being able to send you to an American school mm. and not have to worry about mm. scholarship, uh, you know, not having to worry about paying education loans. And that kind of sets off uh, a positive Yep. cycle right. that definitely kind of uh, is a, is an unfair mm. advantage so to mm. speak that, that I've had. That's a good way to come back to this. They say that what was the number somebody was telling me 40 to 50 percent of school going children in India go to private schools. Uh, if government schools in their form today don't function, do you think that is a testament to how they don't function? as to how they have to change the very fact that 50% of India, and we are talking about India where, you know, like maybe three, four percent of our country pays tax. So that 50% is not affluent, which is taking the additional hassle of paying school fees and the expenses and all of that, sending their children to private schools. Does that talk about public schools in a, I wouldn't say derogatory. Is Is that number true? I'm not sure about the number, but I'll just say it in two parts. Firstly, mm. I think the U.S., by the way, the school, the schooling is not so great. I was going to say exactly yeah. that. Uh, there's enough people to come back from the uh-huh. U.S. in the fifth standard. Uh-huh. Yeah. And here we'll have to go in the third standard. Right. So that should give you a pretty quick benchmark mm. on that. And look, we work with about 1,200 schools in rural India. And I mm. can tell you since you're bringing that, when the, mm. those are Zilla Parishas and those mm. are what you would call the, mm. the schools. But I think... There is a sense of infrastructure that also pulls it down. It's not just that. It's the mm. faculties, the teaching and whatever else mm. you go there. Mm. But I can tell you when we started opening a library mm. in each of the rural schools, mm. magic happened. Mm. The attendance went from 60% mm. to 95%. Mm. That's Just super with that one single situation mm. of opening a library. Because mm. for most people, a library was a locked cupboard behind the principal's door with a key, mm. which nobody had access to. And you couldn't take away a book home. Right. So if you look at the singular parts of what are the triggers of what people do, because Mm. at the end of the day, it's about aspiration, right? Mm. I mean, education is about growing aspiration. Mm. What do you think is tomorrow going to be brighter and better than yesterday? Mm. And I think we spoke a little bit earlier about uh, patriotism in India. Mm. I mean, I can best say that today people are thinking very genuinely that tomorrow is better than yesterday. And I think the soft power that America went through was exactly that. Mm. That soft power gave you the sense that tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday. And I think today the United States is reviewing. Mm. They may not want to admit it, but they're mm. reviewing whether tomorrow is better than yesterday for them. Right. Right. And if you just look at that as one, and mm. I know I'm straying from your specific mm. question on that, mm. but I think you have to look at education now or anything to do with learning with that little bit broader perspective mm. than just attendance, mm. just learning, just grading, mm. private versus public. Mm. And I think it's all about teachers right. in many sense of the word, right? Is that the opportunity the two of you saw? The quality of education 
in government or private in or some private so institutions far as upgrad was concerned i think we are in higher education so i didn't think we didn't look at the k12 market for for a multiple of reasons so you also give us like 30 seconds on what upgrad does and i'll come to you next yeah so if i were to sort of define it i think education is a very calendar event mm. and it's a very preconceived notion where mm. you go through a certain portion of your life and it's over mm. and i think we want to disrupt that space in today's for us the definition of what we want to build mm. is a sort of what i would call learning skilling and a workforce development company mm. and do you also skill people who are already working yes in fact most of the people we mm. skill mm. have to be in some sense of a job in working and the earliest we do is college learners or the last year of college people so you take people in when they 18 19 that kind of age group we don't take but they come to us but yeah <laughs> uh because i think do take you reject no see the beauty about mm. technology in online is it's a you much more inclusive you take because you don't do a pull you don't do marketing advertising as much is that no, why no no for two reasons one uh. is it's a option at that stage you know uh. That's why the calendar event it's not mm. an option it's programmed in your life you have to go to school or you have to go to college mm. or you're going to be called a dropout mm. or you're less privileged mm. but here the optionality of life starts and therefore I think it was more to be we're talking about the fact that optionality starts there right because that's the time when you need to carry on and take it forward right how is an academy different so an academy is i don't internally also we don't think we are in the education business we think we are in this tournament business so what happens is today whether it's 60 million people give uh, these competitive examinations mm. you have your upsc you have your neat you have j and for a huge like for almost everyone who comes to 11 standard or 10 standard mm. the only way to change their socio economic status mm. is by getting selected into these examinations mm. because i i like to think that uh, and and this is what similar to um, what upgrad also does is it helps people get better jobs mm. makes them better skilled mm. so i think that's are you that, both at the same price point in a way no but, but we are in different markets very different very different segments like similar price points uh no no yeah. no which would be higher and lower no no so so you know we cater for ssc examination mm. where a annual subscription would cost 5000 rupees mm. but we have a j examination where an annual subscription would cost 1.2 lakhs mm. So we are sort of in that tournament business where, let's say, if people get selected and they go into an IIT, their life will change. Because IIT will change. is like a lottery. You say tournament because so few get in. Yes. Is it fair to call it a lottery though? No, I'm not calling it a lottery. Mm. I'm calling it a tournament. Yeah. Like we do in India, game of skill. No, no, no. But it's not a. I mean, you. I mean, the kind of people who end up qualifying and the kind of uh, questions that come in these examinations. I mean, we can debate that is this the right way to measure, etc. But we have to all agree to some way of measuring a person's ability. And if uh, hard work is, uh, by the way, I couldn't clear any of those examinations. If people don't know, but I got rejected by a coaching center mm. in Jaipur. There was this coaching center called Resonance, where the, there was this teacher Ashish Arora who eventually joined an academy uh, two years ago. But I, my father takes me to the coaching center. Mm. and they rejected me because uh, to get into that teacher's batch mm. you had to clear a test which i couldn't clear mm. so one of the things that an academy now does is and some of our teachers are paid a million dollars million us dollars we got the best quota in jaipur teachers and they would start teaching and 10000 or 20000 people would teachers attend. are paid a million dollars that's why he started by saying venture capital oh, wow. is that the differentiation no no no, 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 no by the way and no. i think we without venture <laughs> capital nobody gets paid a million dollars these because teachers, there are no merits to these that. teachers were getting they're phenomenal i'm, no, I'm, no, I'm not they were getting paid similar amounts by offline coaching centers who collectively were doing 20000 crores in revenue so between chaitanya between allen between akash and between narayana and i don't want this to become the rameshwaran cafe type <laughs> shot but between these four coaching centers these do 20000 crores in revenue and there are let's say some of these coaching centers would have at least 40 50 teachers who get paid more than 2 crores per annum and some can, of them can i interject funds is that the differentiation why one edtech platform works over another quality of teachers is it syllabus is it teachers but again see you need to in this segment it would be different i mean for me uh, and for the overall working professional it's a lot of plus 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 it's not mm. 
necessarily teachers and faculty, which is the epicenter. Is it the syllabus? Like if you had to pick one at upgrad, would you say syllabus have more weightage or do teachers do? No, I think learning experience and the whole process of learning because it's online is the most important part of it and connecting. Otherwise, I mean, just a lecture today is not going to move the needle from all points of view. Mm-hmm. And if you have just have a TED talk, that's not how you're going to learn for the next mm-hmm. level of what you want yeah, to necessarily yeah. do, right? So I think that is the pivotal part. So for us, learning experience, right now, to me, what I think is going to revolutionize learning mm-hmm. is peer-to-peer learning. Mm-hmm. So while we are talking about teachers and faculty, I can see that trend in the next five years, the power of everything that's going to go to the next level. And maybe not in school, because you do need that basic element. Mm. You can't suddenly have peer-to-peer. Mm. It's peer-to-peer learning. Right? I actually wanted to ask Jay that question. because I agree with this. Yeah. Yeah. Did you go to Harvard because the teachers were good? Mm. And after you went to Harvard, did you learn more from your teachers or your classmates? So Harvard, is actually a, Harvard Business School is a very interesting kind of education model because... It is a combination of teacher to to student and peer to peer because every class is almost like a conductor to an orchestra where the conductor is only kind of, which is the professor, he gives you a case. Everybody has to read it before the class. You assume everybody's read it. It's usually a very interesting Mm -hmm. case on a topic based on what the class is and they have millions of cases. And then the professor has a roadmap of what he or she wants to get out of that discussion, but he pushes different members of the class. And because it's a very diverse class, like for example, on a case where you're talking about Disney, the media company, there was a girl who was a child actress who became a very successful child actress and then a media executive and then came to Harvard Business School and had an interesting perspective to share with the rest of the class. And likewise, on other topics. That's to me, I learned a lot but more. What was most course. valuable? Was it the network, the classmates and what you learned off them or was it the teaching staff? No, but like for him, it would be different than for what it would be for a normal person. No, I, I disagree. No, no, but I, because the normal person is going there for an intent to eventually get a very high paying job. In no. Harvard? I don't think I don't so. Think no. so. I don't think so. No, that wouldn't necessarily so. be the case. I think that... Uh, That's normally a given by the yeah, time you're I think that. that for most people, they already have some form of reasonable paying job before they come for an MBA. Because in the US, unlike in India, you don't do an MBA right after your undergrad. It's usually anywhere from three to six years of work experience. And because the school is so selective, these folks tend to have gone to... IITs mm. or, you know, very good schools mm. to begin with. what's the intent? So the intent is to go, to up-level yourself into being a business leader and to being a, a more well-rounded professional and person. But, so what I had heard, and mm. maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the most sought-after jobs after, H, after somebody completes HPS mm. are private equity firms, hedge funds, uh, venture capital That's firm. changing. You're, you're 10 years behind. Yeah, you're, you're 10 time, years and You're behind. the youngest of the lot, but you're yeah. 10 years behind. You're 10 years behind. I would say I graduated six years ago uh. and it had already started to change. So what is it? Entrepreneurship, uh, software product management. Yeah, uh, you're, you're, you're hanging on you too know, much with investment bankers. and management. Of course, there is a, a large cohort of people that are going into private equity, that are going into investment banking, there is always, you know, those are important pillars. But even of, there, it's with an entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. Even yes. Even there, it's with an entrepreneurial mindset. Most people mindset. do that as a, hey, okay. And not with that career mindset. No, but so, so you are essentially saying that people are going into HPS to become entrepreneurs. But if you see the people who are like... I don't think we should single it yeah. out in an HPS manner. I, I think manner, it's all of these kind of... Yeah. Uh, no, but Ronnie, MBAs. like you and Nikhil mentioned... I mean, you became entrepreneurs because of who you were and not because of the education you were. No, 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 not, not at all. all. It not was the all. same human emotions, greed, yeah. hunger, insecurity, exactly. all of yeah. that. Exactly, yeah. and not yeah. because of a college education. No, no, the, the, it's, it, it's not an education as much as it's that in a, it's an immersion into a, a pool of very interesting people. And you go as a sponge That's and you come That's actually the out. question I was asking yeah. you. Is that your biggest yes. takeaway from that? that? Hands down, I See, would say. as a say leader, it. you need to be a great catalyst. Mm-hmm. And I think what you just defined is the just network being in a, a phenomenal yeah. catalyst, right? you know, that ability yeah. to. And, you know, coming back to, we were talking about Kotak being a, mm. a, 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 a large company. Mm. And we're very small if we compare to truly large companies, mm. uh, you know, uh, around the world. And 
one of the things I see looking at that and looking at us and larger companies is that the skill sets you need is so much more about people, mm. managing people, leadership, motivation. Uh, and I can say that culture. just from the outside yeah. and I've interacted with many people mm -hmm. in Kota, but I've interacted with them for 10 and 15 years. Yeah. Mm. And that continuity of that culture that is there right. comes from somebody being a phenomenal catalyst mm. that has therefore sprouted enough owners within mm. an yes. organization. So there's an interesting yes. question for the two of you. If the biggest USP of colleges, Ivy, I, let's not pick on Harvard, yeah. let's say Ivy colleges in the US, for example, Ivy League colleges, is the network, the connections, all of that occur there. Can edtech, where you learn through a medium, without human interaction with your peers in a way, ever truly compete with that? The vision for us is to be inclusive. The vision there is to be exclusive. So they're two different tracks I, I, and I get two this. different it's parameters. A, it's a much larger no, experience see. for a larger set of people, but do much you think, larger, I mean, yeah. much larger. Yeah. I mean, but me, do you think this can compete with that? So let me let me just give hmm. you an example. So we have products for people ranging from 17 year olds to 29, 30 year olds. Yeah. There is this examination people prepare for called NEET PG. Hmm. If you became a doctor and you want to do your post graduate, post graduation, um, and get your MD, etc., you give this NEET PG examination. Now, the younger you are you need more coaching, you need more intervention, you need somebody to call you and tell you, please study, you need more discipline. But need PG, where well, let's say we own 24% market share, the problem there is people say, we don't need offline coaching centers. And even if you give them great content, but boring content, mm. they will open the app because the intent is so high, they will study it without even building social interactions. Mm. So. If your question is on whether this can be done, that you don't need, let's say, without a network, etc., can you build that? That depends on how much intent. But what are you building? At this point, the government of India has, or even some private institutions, have these tournaments. If you crack these tournaments, uh, your life changes. We are coaches of that tournament. Now, and and. No, I'm, I'm totally with you up until here. But your question you can, of whether you, you need to compete, I think it, and that was your real mm. question there. Firstly, yeah. I'm saying... That let's, say, let's say education is a priority, mm -hmm. is a precursor to having a certain kind of individual, a certain kind of 30-year-old man, for example. Which is also changing. Yeah, no, that's I'm, also changing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no can, longer that formal context has not got the same weightage that it had before. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's part you, of you that is experience. The formal one that you mean the degrees, etc. Yep. Yeah, part of that yep. is experience. Part of that is, for the lack of a better word, somebody's motivation to learn on their own. No, I think Many the skill things. sets today to be job ready yeah. are very different. Yeah. But do you think a person who takes this medium? I'm talking about using upgrad, using an academy, clearing a certain exam. Uh, if education was online, if the distribution of education, they're not going to a college eventually, they're consuming all of the education online through a medium, through a device. Can that compete or, or compare so, with real life education? Nikhil, I want so to, if I'm competing uh, in terms of outcomes, then I just yeah, want to say okay. that, what am I competing on? If I'm to competing in terms of final outcome, mm. report card being outcome, absolutely. Right. Absolutely, because you're visualizing a brick and mortar space, mm. and, and I'm visualizing a, a, a surreal space. Mm. And if I, and people who operate in all spaces today. Yeah, I think the outcome I'm looking for is not necessarily Mark's card. Do you? Do you? Have you? It's used not necessarily this? Mark's card. Yeah, it's success yeah. in life. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and if your question is more about online, do you know about Roblox? So there is an app called Roblox in US. Every kid between 6 to 16, like one in every three kids spend more than two hours on the app. So it's a metaverse, gaming metaverse, where you can play games with your friends, etc. That is now replacing some of the offline experiences. So you can go to an amusement park with your friends, and it's a mobile app, it's not a VR headset. You can go to an amusement park with five of your friends, have social interactions, and then there are these game developers which are building experiences. So my belief is that if you have built that or what Minecraft has done, 
if you have built those kind of experiences and you are seeing kids addicted to those experiences and they are doing experiences online this is actually interesting i saw yeah. this on a elon musk yeah. interview he said it's easy to get kids to play video games the question is can you tweak the video games just enough to make, to make the them ex- learning and experience yeah. and they are already there so so there oh, by the way there is a chemistry lab experience on but roblox but when you tweak that and i'm coming back to the peer to peer the reason why that's a great learning medium is you don't need an intermediary you mm. don't need that one pontiff you don't right. need somebody on the pulpit yeah. right and then roblox is exactly peer to peer yeah a game developer developed a chemistry lab experience that if you mix these two things a reaction will happen mm. you go there with five of your friends and you are doing experiences you can also click virtual selfies etc and you're posting there so i think like that will happen and if you have to crack online education you won't say that i will have boring content is that the next big thing in online education peer to peer make it big there is no big things in life you have to uh-huh. make them big so oh, the next thing this is a good this i mean this yeah. is <laughs> this <laughs> Donnie is consistent yeah, yeah. this I, is i'm telling you that yeah. it's not about whether it's time is arrived you're to make its time arrive yeah. from yeah. that perspective and it's absolutely ready to be mm. there so if i'm a so the only thing about thing is acceptance or open mindedness when mm. you look at these two things and i think yes and 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 my belief is that you have to make some you know i wrote this blog post long back about good addiction products like how some of the best minds of the world are working on GTA or FIFA or you know making every experience or Instagram so addictive yeah but some of the best minds are not working on education being super addictive so once we why is st- why is GTA FIFA etc addictive and by the way that's recorded content so if you can make recorded content multiplayer so addictive you can do that with education why why is it addictive and why is education not what needs to change gamification like like if you Uh, you know there is this game called jailbreak on roblox simple game super simple graphics but one is the social aspect element of it the second is the gamification element of it mm. um if you read this book called actionable gamification it breaks down every single aspect of why you get addicted to a game mm. you people play games that they win mm. so today if they are sitting in a coaching center where you don't even get entry to a best teachers class because mm. they say you are number 100 mm. that won't work but if there is an ai app that says that so the ai app can actually say that nikhil you want to learn this it can real time generate a lesson for you mm. the, by the way this is not happening but we have to make it happen and can start giving you questions so basically and, 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 and they have to give you some positive reinforcement because if you start playing if fifa only had world class mode and didn't have a amateur mode you would never play fifa no, that's so quite it interesting this is a sh- sharp word but mm. i think if you look at i mean i come from a media background so mm. i think storytelling mm. is a very important aspect mm. of what hooks you on right? right and i think i mean the very fact that that same narrative is coming there is because there's a storytelling element to that context and and, and that's j- why that's why some of our top educators work if Absolutely. you if you see yeah, their class that's class, the ability if you see their classes yeah um uh, and i think when jay gave the example of this young girl who came in she was a child artist mm. and whatever else if you look yeah. at that you know and it stuck with him yeah, yeah. it stuck with him in that element of a storytelling and i think if you can bring that element to your learning mm. and hold on to people's attention so i'm thinking I, like I'm, uh, i'm thinking in the manner that a 24 year old starting a business in edtech would think today mm-hmm. so i need to incorporate peer to peer gamify the experience in some manner and storytelling has to be a more integral part of it is that the summary no, of no, what you said no no but if you pick but one of those i think outcome is a very if, important if part because pick, all of this if you don't mm, figure out therefore mm, what's the end thing because what do you think the outcome should be see because in school there's a mm. defined outcome either mm. it's in marks or you yeah. move from one standard to the mm. other so there's a calendar event that's done mm. there here you have to set your own benchmarks for that and it is road to to some sense of success entrepreneurship or job enablement to move forward in your career it's as simple as that yeah that i fully agree it's simple yeah. do you think our current benchmarks are not well placed to cope with the changes that are happening like education makes in my view i'll give you my experience of education right I went to a terrible school i hated my school hated my teachers grew up being scared of things i should not have been scared of i was probably scared of my class class teacher this teacher that teacher stopped going to school 
beyond the 10th, I didn't go. I started working and stuff like that. But what I remember of school is it taught me to be conformist in a manner where their idea of what I should be, their idea of what I should learn, their idea of what is required to get the outcome we just spoke about, being job, success, entrepreneurship, whatever, that was met. But that idea seems to be changing very quickly in the world. I don't think you become successful 10 years from now yeah. by being conformist anymore. So my, my, my view on that is that the definition of school is also changing. For example, if you ask an 11th or 12th year, 12th standard student, especially if they are not preparing for test prep or if they are because of their parents said so, if you truly ask them what they want to be, being a YouTuber would be a, like a lot of people would say they want to be a YouTuber. Really? Now, yeah. yeah. And, and, and why, do, why does that work? Or a, or a social media celebrity of some kind. And, but and I think that cycle is turning. No, no. But why that works is you need to realize mm. YouTube is sort of like a school mm. with instant gratification mm. and which is non-linear. Mm. At school, you could get X marks. On YouTube, if you crack something, you can get like 500,000 marks in a way. Mm. You know, th th those are the kind of views that we get. Mm. So that's why I also start thinking that if people eventually want to play non-linear games, mm. these platforms that have opened up, there, there are... 15 year old kids who are making games on Roblox. Mm. There are, there, there is a kid, one of the most, a YouTuber who earns, fifth largest YouTuber in the world who earns the most money is a kid who reviews toys. Mm. And he makes like $30 million. Mm. So what year. are you saying about education? So we're saying school no, what I'm saying teaches is, you to be too conformist. So what, what I'm saying is that YouTube in a way has become sort of like a parallel school. Right. People might not start when they are in school. Do you think that's the future? More democratized peer-to-peer -peer education? Think, I don't think schooling, we should mm. be, we, we should, mm. in our lifetimes also, mm. forget mine, in, <laughs> <coughs> it's not going to get disrupted to, right. to that level. Why? Is and, I'm, and I'm not saying that will be disrupted. If it does, it'll be at that very top 1% level. I agree with. It's I agree not going to get disrupted. I think and that. actually, in some ways, it shouldn't. Mm. I agree with that. that it needs to be. Mm. Why? Because you need to layer, yeah. you need to build on situation. One of the reasons where I reached where I reached was because I found YouTube. Yeah. I didn't crack any examinations. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you see what are these tournaments, one tournament is that in a traditional sense, if you become good at physics, chemistry, maths, mm. and you crack that examination, I think that's powerful. But I couldn't. I went to a college which had too much fees, where the mm. best job you could get was in one of these IT services companies, three and a half lakhs. And there was no way I wanted to get that job. Not saying that's a bad job, but that's not, that was not for me. So in a way, and, and, and this is why I think upgrad and higher ed needs to change is, if I have life mein wo thappa lag gaya, ki aapne neet crack nahi kara, how do you change that? No, okay. If you if you didn't go to a good college, how do you change that? And I think YouTube is one way. Upgrade me. If I can get a good degree and that gives me exposure, that's one way. So what I'm saying is that think of a kid who didn't crack. Let's say top three top three percent of kids get into these good colleges. What about the ninety seven percent? They go into these engineering colleges in let's say tier two, tier three cities. Their job placement rate is. 2%, 5%, 10%. unka kya hoga? So they, their capability is there, but they don't get the exposure. But is that a problem that there are not enough jobs? Or is that a problem that they're not well enough educated? Both. See, education doesn't solve for exposure. LinkedIn You know why people prepare for UPSC examinations. There is a friend of mine. She gave the UPSC examinations four to five times. Extremely smart friend. I'm like, you gave the examination five times. Why? Because of the predictability. Okay, once I crack it, I will get this wealth or this status or this credibility or my father would give me validation. So at the end of the day, you know, it take, I mean, it takes a lot of years for you to come out of the shell that was created for you, etc. And you are always seeking that validation. But, and this, this is my question to all of you. Think of a kid, and this is a huge chunk of our population. The kid does not crack a good examination. The kid goes to an average college. 
the college does not give get the kid a job what does he or she do but that's changing in many ways i, I feel like for one more life mm. because i think we want to look at a broad topic like we are about mm. changing a job it's quite universal mm. and we won't draw the best examples and inspiration for the people who, who are kind of listening to this unless yeah. we take a little bit more of a global perspective without yeah. being just completely exactly. global correct and correct. global does not mean the us because yeah. africa mm. vietnam mm. some other markets like mm. that very 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 unique and different but if you take the cluster of all of that together mm. Mm. you'll actually find some very clear parallels mm. that actually can make you give you so i think i just wanted to put that into perspective yeah. that some of the challenges on a country wide basis is not going to be able to solve yeah. but if you put a lot of those perspectives you can have a bigger solution right. and then it'll start applying to a lot of stuff yeah i'm going to keep everything a little more concise mindful of time but i would like to you know maybe add here that today companies like facebook google tesla even us here in india we don't care about educational qualification in the manner that once we once did yeah like we don't ask for people to tell us what qualification they have i have not hired anybody ever looking at their degree and their marks no but nikhil i think that's a sliver yeah. at the top in more evolved parts of mm. our job ecosystem i think the moment you go one level down you being an ias officer or being an iit grad absolutely matters but i have a separate question if the system was good and the test was meritocratic in the right set of ways and everybody had equal opportunity what's wrong with the test or a way that kind of tells folks who are looking to hire that from this pool this is the most capable i agree it's not where it is right now and that's where you know a lot of that solve has no, to happen no but uh, i think the test is good i am talking about folks yeah but capable is the key word yeah. so i think you know today more and more we are now hard hard driving those ones what is yeah. capability what is readiness yeah. what is whatever yeah. else what are you at the cusp of so i think that all those are changing which is yeah. why i still believe there are some fundamental things that need to be built on but yeah disrupt just for the sake of disrupt actually no, creates a little bit more chaos what skill set do you need to ace these tests and is that relevant to you doing the job you I mean, get after the test well soft skills for us here it's a very sophisticated word i mean mm. i call them super skills mm. and i don't even yeah. call them soft skills mm. yeah because i just realized as a marketing person mm. that as soon as you add shakti man to something mm. then there's a little bit more attention right so yeah. you say super skills versus soft skills soft skills sounds yeah. very soft yeah, yeah. super sounds i've already like They're a punchy situation it's the the soft skills yeah the higher up you go in terms of metaphorically the success ladder which is a crude way of putting it soft skills becomes more important indeed super skills but you are a product of soft skills yeah mm. i'm exactly. a product of soft skills mm. what does that mean Be- otherwise after 10 standard if you haven't done it what else would have got you through life it yeah. is your mm. it is those soft skills it is that super skills that you managed to build on to that stayed with it whatever else through a background through a financial whatever else and you built on it no mm. but uh, but don't you think that's trivializing it trivializing the issue to like f- for example or shining the light on it okay I mean yes I mean trivializing it by saying is it so simple yeah we are but I think when you really find big solutions when you simplify it not when you complicate it I agree things like empathy things like leadership are and the ability to kind of be with seven people that have different backgrounds and lead that team or you know figure out what motivates who is a very different skill than yeah. solving an extremely mm. complicated alpha numeric equation 5 years back if i was looking f- to back a founder or f- hire somebody which is a, as a partner with me i would <laughs> say problem solving skills is important mm. today i'm saying spot the problem before you can solve it because i'm not right. looking for problem solvers anymore right i'm looking no. for problem spotters i'm looking yeah. for the guy who looks around the bend yes. and sees is the train going to hit me or the truck going to hit me right and not somebody's going to solve it because even that time mm. and density we right. don't have right. right makes sense see if i take a you, simplistic view my belief is that everyone is collecting these badges and these credentials which is what education is about now if somebody takes an online degree from upgrad great degree that's a badge because some like like i was talking to a svp of mine and his wife had taken an upgrad course i asked him why did she take that uh she said uh, he said that for her the moment she put that on her linkedin profile suddenly she started getting more requests so in a way what test prep is also doing is 
यू आर कलेक्टिंग दीज बैजेस मैंने ये एग्जाम क्रैक कर लिया आई हैव दिस डिग्री आई वेंट टू दिस कॉलेज और आई हैव सो मैनी सब्सक्राइबर्स सो और आई बिल्ट दिस गेम विच वॉज प्लेड बाय सो मैनी पीपल इन अ वे आई लाइक टू थिंक दैट दैट्स वॉट एजुकेशन इज बिकमिंग अबाउट ऑन हाउ एंड एंड देन यू कैन से दैट आर सिस्टम करेंटली इज लिमिटेड कि अभी ये छः बैजेज ही अवेलेबल हैं बट वॉट ऑनलाइन कैन सॉल्व फॉर एज के से कि यू नो यू कैन डू दीज थ्री थिंग्स ऑल्सो दिस इज वॉट ऑनलाइन इज नॉट दैट डिफरेंट इट इज एन इंक्लूसिव मीडियम बिकॉज exclusive is a problem mm. here i have to get a test prep to get into iit mm. exactly it's perfectly fine mm. phenomenal world out there but hello mm. we're 10 billion people in the world right now 8 billion going to 10 billion people mm. right so obviously that opportunity of being very democratic on what we want to do is going to mm. it's going to have to change quite radically i think education has to solve for so one part of it is the badge gets you into the room with the recruiter and the hr and then you know the job the far bigger challenge is once you're in the job how are you good at it are you good at it because there's only so much that you can no uh, i think i think i think the opposite is true i think today getting into the room is a bigger challenge people are still there are like if if like for example nikhil said that they don't look at the iit tag if you don't look at that tag there are still great people a bigger challenge for who and when show sure, for 20 for 18 to 23 year olds probably and yes it is a challenge because there are not that many jobs which is a se- separate problem to solve but being good at something anything is very important and education should be solving for how to make people passionate about things that they yeah, then without using the word education because yeah. again you get back into yes. a little bit of a structured mera, environment mera usme, yeah. it's mera, very unstructured mera usme problem hai ki that's not a education issue that's a motivation issue अगर आप किसी को बोल दोगे कि ये क्रैक करके ये मिलेगा दे विल वर्क मोर एक्स्ट्रा हार्ड फॉर दैट माइट बी लिटिल टू सिंप्लीफाइंग इट बिकॉज यू डू नीड यू डू नीड दैट प्रॉम्प्ट यू नीड दैट प्रॉम्प्ट शीट यू नीड दैट प्रॉम्प्ट शीट यू नीड दैट हैक यू नीड दैट एलिमेंट मेरा माई बिलीफ इज एंड वी वी कैन अग्री टू डिस अग्री हेयर इंस्टेड ऑफ बॉटम्स ऑफ द टॉप डाउन अप्रोच वर्क एंड दैट्स हाउ पीपल थिंक फॉर एग्जाम्पल फॉर दैट person who bought that upgrade course it was like i want a job and this particular product helps me get more exposure so i think it starts from the fact ke mujhe 12 lakh ka job chahiye mujhe 18 lakh ka job chahiye that's why i want to crack an iit examination and that's why if you i i, I was on a flight and i was seeing an indigo or vistara magazine every single college ad now had placements with amount of packages people were getting Yeah, because I think जब वो पता चल जाता है कि अच्छा इस कॉलेज में एवरेज पैकेज कितना जाता है और इस कॉलेज में बिकॉज आई आई लाइक टू बिलीव दैट इट्स नॉट ओवर सिंप्लीकेशन बट इट्स द रियालिटी के इफ यू से दैट यू विल गेट एक्स आफ्टर डूइंग वाई देन पीपल आर मोर मोटिवेटेड सो आई डोंट थिंक इट्स अ एजुकेशन इशू आई थिंक इट्स अ मोटिवेशन इशू या एंड इट्स नॉट मे बी इट्स नॉट एन आई दर ऑल्सो आई डोंट थिंक इट्स अबाउट अस डिस अग्रीन और अग्रीन इन दैट कॉन्टेक्स because it's such a it's such a massive challenge and such a massive opportunity frankly mm. uh, but but do you think that would anybody learn anything for the sake of learning for example yeah, yeah. yes yeah everything yeah. i yeah. do yeah. for the yeah. sake yeah. of yes. learning that's myopic i think maybe our, our society has kind of conditioned us into that but can i tell you like personal example my initial phase of learning was based out of insecurity i didn't go to school i didn't go to 11th standard 12th standard all my classmates did that insecurity drove me to learn but there is selection bias see we are, hmm. there is also a lot of selection bias in if, if, if we talk about people in the world we talk about any product that has been no not selection bias but where i'm getting to today is i've stopped reading the kind of stuff that i read back then which would help me be better at a job yeah. and today i keep reading about history and psychology and yeah. philosophy and these things i do not for a job this is just because i find them but i think that stuff mm. does help you be better yeah in life and job is part of life yeah. in terms of identifying you just want to be more rounded yeah. every mm. single day of your life to yeah. simplify it i read it because i enjoy it but but again i would say that's like a very 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 small subset of the population but i think more more of the population has yeah. to move there and i yeah. hope that, organically that, 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 I yeah. that i agree that i, I agree think, that yeah. how do we Because um, otherwise we'll get yeah. stuck at the entry gate. Yes, mm-hmm. we're not at the gate of heaven. Yeah, we're, we're going to try and experience the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So all I would say is you're right at the entry gate, but there's much more than the entry gate. 
and i think we we might be all saying the same thing hmm. but at different positions in what the, the root of this is at some level something you said maybe 5 minutes earlier where you said education and exposure are different to me i think if i think about education as a lifelong process exposure is an integral part of education that becomes a larger piece of that pie it just depends on what the context of education is here if we're talking about education in the context of companies solving for a piece of the value chain to make profit then it's probably a different education than a you know more abstract idea yeah i mean this conversation we're having mm. is a is a learning curve of some way i mean i i i keep being not wanting to use the word education because it the the perception comes back into a little bit exactly. of a formal structure part exactly and yeah. and and, and, I mean, I, and i and i and i get in two hours if i can pick up uh, three nuggets and go away i'm not going to yeah. remember the whole two hours of the conversation i, I can throw like nuggets. another like digress this conversation into another place altogether let's say the world evolves tomorrow a lot of the jobs get replaced by computers and so on and so forth hmm. there are not enough jobs in the world to in material of how skilled the person applying for the job is let's say that equilibrium is not met world transforms into some kind of socialism but by choice capitalism hmm. right like hmm. thomas piketty spoke about donut economics where we are yeah. in equanimity with nature in a way growth for the sake of growth is not good let's universal, say universal basic income is there yeah ubi is there hmm. people are getting paid people do not then I have i think global warming will come in sooner yeah. than that <laughs> one if you ask me here i i personally uh, like i know a lot of people are very critical of, of global warming like we have a big fund rain matter climate we do a lot of uh, work around climate change i tend to be more sanguine about it in many ways when i look at the world today i feel we are the luckiest we have the best version of the world any of our ancestors ever did we live for 40 years longer than we lived 100 years ago yep. we didn't have to see world wars we didn't have to see racism we didn't have to see uh disease malnutrition all of this in the manner that our predecessors had to uh so sure global warming is a problem we have to work on it we have to like you know work on negating the effects of climate change but notwithstanding that i think in the future if ubi were to come in i feel the kind of learning that we are talking about will become the only kind of learning where people choose to learn a certain thing because they want to learn absolutely. it i agree yeah. yeah and to get on with what they want to do in life absolutely and that that to me is the is the fun part of it it's a limitless and this is how life used to be world. like if you go back 2000 years ago philosophy was not something yeah. people spent like a ancillary subject like yeah. the greek way of living yeah. was the philosopher king yeah. basically no, today's turning inwards yeah. is giving you a much different depth and that's why i'm saying therefore let's not tinker with the opening hmm. part of what we keep saying that all of this can only happen if you go back to the foundation yeah. hmm. sure yes of course we can teach sex education better in school we can teach entrepreneurship hmm. we can teach competitive by virtue of where the world is going maybe sex education yeah. suddenly has become a very meta thing we need people to have more kids all over again so yeah. we yeah. being do. pragmatic again But maybe sex education should not be done will you nini look at that that context where you're mm. moving in because of your other exposures mm. in life and that's why i was saying there's a certain cost to an mm. event let that be there mm. because it's evolving in itself mm. but i think the important part that we brought up here also was are there going to be that many jobs and therefore what's everyone doing in this entire space to be able to do yeah. that and water does find its level of course it goes through troughs in many ways but water does find its own level in mm. many ways hopefully i wouldn't say hopefully that's the wrong word for it likely there will also be lesser people in the future i think this but if i had everything formal hmm. i wouldn't be able to survive and create opportunities but because hmm. i'm going to have this informal approach to a hmm. situation there more likelihood i'm going to succeed in an hmm. environment which is fragile yeah. and unpredictable because yeah. actually today what i think the next 100 years going to face is much more fragility hmm. much I'm more not, uncertainty i'm not sure as a student of history um i think that there's enough historical parables to say that this is indeed what is happening but i my personal instinct is i believe in capitalism i believe in our ability to solve problems in the context that i actually don't think either we're going to run out of jobs 
Yeah. Because I think that for every job that gets taken away, mm. for sure. new jobs are coming and it's been happening for the past 150 years. My context years. was more that extremes of extreme negative, extreme positives may become a little bit more. Polarization may happen to a, a, a larger extent. But yeah. I fully agree. I'm not a pessimist yeah. on the fact that we're going to run out of jobs. Also on climate change, which yeah. is the one that maybe we disagree. Yeah. I think, yes, there will, there will be an mm. impact. Mm. We, I think we all agree on mm. science and all of that. But we will solve when it becomes... Mm. Okay. And there, there is okay. precedent for that, right? Like we solved the ozone layer issue. Yeah. The world together did. Did we? I don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You remember like 10 years ago, yeah. everybody was like ozone, ozone, yeah, yeah, yeah. ozone layer, hole in the ozone layer. Nobody talks no. about it Slightly now. Slightly more in our control because we were mm. creating it and therefore we could control it. Couldn't yeah. you but also argue climate change we're creating? Yeah, it, it can. Mm. It could, it could, but it's a little bit yeah. in mm. that space. But I think what will happen before this climate change inevitability that a lot of people prophesize is I think geoengineering will become such a big field in itself. Yeah. Like if we were to like very simply talk about climate change, right? Sun hits earth, each surface yeah. reflects a certain kind of heat back. Yeah. It gets trapped in the atmosphere, albedo effect. Based on what gases are in the atmosphere, that much heat does not go out. Yeah. But things like adding sulfur yeah. into the stratosphere, technology around covering the ice caps with some form of limestone. Yeah. Geoengineering in itself, like everything else, like if we've been resilient as humans for hundreds of thousands of years, yeah. I don't see why in that minute 60, 70 years that we are around, will the world collapse in front of my eyes. Yeah. Mathematically, the odds of that to me are Minuscule. Collapse, yeah. maybe not. Deteriorate could yeah. be Deteriorate another way. But, but the world's always changing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Yeah. Like, I agree. Deteriorate is a very relative world. Like if you talk about relative to the previous hundred years, we should be happy with where we are now. Yeah. And hopefully hundred years down the line, we are there. And But coming I'm, back to a topic mm, that yeah, we were talking yeah, here, I'm yeah. saying, therefore in that environment, mm. it's even more that you need that flexibility versus the mm. formality of it. Yeah. yeah. So what we are saying to summarize the last bit of our conversation, what needs to change about education or what people looking to build around education need to bear in mind is the near future could be a time of increased gamification, changing, not replacing the bricks of education, if we were to consider it a wall, but a lot of tweaking of the bricks to make it less conformist in the manner where your ability to regurgitate information is not as valuable as it was 20 years ago. That change will likely happen and people need to bear that in mind. And another point you brought up is peer-to-peer -peer will become increasingly relevant. Like Jay also said, going to Harvard is as much about the other people who went yeah. with him to Harvard than it is about syllabus, teachers, teaching staff. Yeah. In the interest of time, moving on, you brought up Baiju's for a second. Would you like to, because it's all over the news, if you guys have an opinion, like would love to hear it since you're both in this space. No, I think I don't have a particular opinion on Baiju, mm. but I will make a more generic statement. Mm. I think what has happened is that any new employee I'm interviewing, any new investor who comes and talks to me, there is this sort of negativity about edtech and the people who are in edtech know that it's a phenomenal sector. I mean, the kind of pools, revenue pools that it has, whether it's in higher education or in test prep or in K-12, it's amazing. I mean, I was giving you the example that the top 10 offline coaching centers of the country do 20,000 crores in revenue annually. But if you don't even go top 10, if you go localized, in Madhya Pradesh, there is an exam called MPPSC. There is a coaching center, six or seven institutes, that helps people prepare for that examination, does 150 crores a year. And there are hundreds of such examples. So that revenue pool exists offline. You can bring that online. Similarly, in higher education, whether any kind of college that helps people getting get better skilled or get a better job, there is a huge opportunity to disrupt. Don't take this from a perspective where somebody is comparing one company with another. Hmm. It is not about an academy, it is not even no, really about sector, I'm talking about the sector, that the sector where is do you, Where do you think as a cycle, every stock, every sector 
has cycles. So if you were to paint the cycle like this, where do you think EdTech is at right now? Very simple, concise answer. I think in COVID, we were at the peak. Mm. And then uh, last year, I think at least for us, we would say that we were going through a lot of tough times. Mm. Now we are climbing back up. Right. Uh, and, and that's more an academy and I can't say for others, but that's what we are. Yeah, uh, look, there is no mm. this at all, to no? be honest, because the opportunity and what the need is, mm. is absolutely massive. Mm. The, there's a revolution going on in reskilling mm. today. There's a mm. dire need for it. It's mm. like a clarion mm. call in many ways. Mm. So there's no opportunity for anything to go up and down here. Mm. When we look at this up and down, we only categorize it in terms of uh, investment bankers or valuation, which are so irrelevant. Capital is not going to change learning, skilling, and this thing. And, 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 and 10 times more capital mm. coming is not going to give you 10 times faster result. Mm. In fact, it's going to slow the process down. Why is that? Because you don't need capital to make the changes that you need to make. Not everything is about capital. Mm. So Doesn't I think, capital afford you larger distribution in a manner no. where you can reach more people? No, no. I think, like if you I'm could not talking make, about zero capital, mm. but I'm not talking about the capital that everyone thinks that mm. that capital, if you throw mm. at, mm. this is a this is an overall... Have you ever raised money at Upright? Yes, we have raised mm. money. Yeah, but I'm saying... The cap capital for most people sounds like the, if you're looking at such a large sector mm. and since you're talking about your core group that will want to listen to this one go there, mm. one of the things I would say is you don't need to have that kind of capital to make the change in this sector. Mm. And that's going to be the fun part of it mm. because then it'll be longer lasting. It'll mm. be a lot more mm. permanent. Right. And I think the foundation will be even stronger. For what about physics, wala guy? Like, what is he doing which is so different? I hear so much about physics, wala. Have you heard of him? So there is this guy who is not spending money in the same amount and extent as other edtech players, but is able to gather an audience, a paying audience, hmm. based on his popularity, based on some say the quality of his teaching in physics or whatever. Like The other way to look at that is uh, he built a business very frugally. Hmm accepted that you don't need money on it. Mm. And it's taken a fair bit of time to come to where he has. Mm. And I think that's where the credit comes mm. versus anything else. Because so you, you like him then? Yeah, I like yeah. everybody who's an uh, entrepreneur and founder yeah, because yeah. it's so bloody difficult yeah. to do anything yeah. in life. So yeah. everyone needs yeah. incredible amount of respect. And at the point in which you are, obviously, as you rightly said, there'll mm. be ups and downs. Mm. But my question here is, what he did right is not put capital epicenter. Mm took a long-term view mm. and the result you're seeing right now, mm. you have to go back for the last eight years and analyze that and you see that report card mm. and you see somebody else's report card mm. of a chest thumping moment or raising a billion dollars. The answer is yeah. right there. This thematically is true across, mm. you know, mature companies, newer companies, folks that don't talk as much, mm. sometimes can quietly build something and when they come out, it feels like, it just oh, happened. it just happened and another part to link to something we said much earlier, not fundraising mm. immediately puts you outside of that, uh, you know, media spotlight and this spotlight of, oh, wow, mm. I am a unicorn because I fundraised at a certain valuation. And, you know, mm. now I'm notionally at that value, you mm. know, valuation. There's a lot of companies in India and, and around the world that are quiet. Mm. And just to put this in the sector that mm. um, Jay is in, I mean, you've seen that. I mean, you don't need to go into the startup world to do that. You've seen banks have a different situation and mm. how mm. levels of corruption, excess, mm. transparency have come in there just based on being mm. funding. So it's not mm. an ecosystem here. It's mature ecosystems yeah. like banking where you can have yeah. that. Highly regulated system. Ah, just remembered have. something since you're here. What do you mm. think of the new TCS on LRS? I think it's complicated because mm. at one level, if we want the rupee to be mm. competitor to the dollar, mm. to the yuan, we want to be free float mm. as much as possible. And you want to be capital yeah, convertible. You, you, you want to be completely convertible. Mm. But it's very easy to say that. Mm. Can I ask you to prophesy if India were to become truly convertible, capital yeah. account convertible? Let's say LRS, the money going out of the country is maybe $22 billion. Let's make yeah. our assumption. It's somewhere around yeah. that this year. Yeah. Do you think more money would go out or more money would so, come in? I ask you this, while I preface 
that every international bank and investor I meet today wants to come to India. Wants I to think come right to now India. money would come in. Money is coming in. India is doing very Actually well. Actually, agree with you. And to on on the uh, LRS TCS point, there is the real fact that this was a loophole. Hmm. The fact that yeah, that's what uh, I'm saying. In that context, we have to look at it in that loophole but element. Is the there, question which is did just they clarified in is some the form. question did they plug the loophole or did they make it significantly harder for people? I think they did it in three doses, which then got yeah. into an element of miscommunication. Yes. If you ask me, but, but beyond the, the third dose, you still have to pay twenty percent TCS when you spend your LRS. But you can get, you can claim it back. Yes, it's. I would say that. Is it the most elegant solution? Yeah. One could argue not. Is, is the onus going to be on you guys as a bank? Uh, uh, my understanding is that banks, anybody, uh, if somebody spends on on a bank's credit card, the bank is accountable to implement regulation, and that's part of being a regulated entity. And that's a significantly unnecessary cost no, for you guys. No, I don't think no? that's the case at all. There is lots of regulation. We also uh, the word bank comes with a lot of trust. Mm. and that trust mm. while is a good thing in terms of attracting customers mm. attracting deposit comes mm. with responsibility great power comes great, great responsibility that is the regulators can make a change that they see fit for for policy and i think you know, sometimes you get irritated because of the communication level yeah. and when you do it in three doses and mm. then yeah. everyone thinks now this is just enough yeah. like why do you want to get there but at the end of the day the report card is quite yeah. clear yeah if If you are spending two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, yeah. which means you should be a high tax paying bracket yeah. or a, a yeah. sufficient good tax paying bracket, yeah. in which case you'll be cash neutral at the end of the year. Yeah. yeah, my my point here is I actually truly believe, right? This is not for the sake of euphemizing some other thought of mine, but every international investor I talk to today is really critical, especially in America, in the West, in Europe. They're they're really critical about their own economy but i would say 80 90% are sanguine about the prospect of india and wanting wanting some but form I think of participation here we're a very good here. rational yeah. tax country we're we're, one, we're not yeah. one of the higher not, tax not countries not based on tax ex- taxation but if we open up i truly believe more money will come in but i don't think this is got to do with open up mm. it's not about it's sh- sure sorry carry on i'll go after yeah. you no because i think this if he, there was a reverse gst on it and for every 250 you are gone with you know this is not that it is just about saying we don't know whether you necessarily pay your tax mm. and therefore take it at the end of the year if you open up completely mm. you also become mercy even more mm. to something the fed may do mm. that is really silly that causes mm. violent capital flight that was nothing to do with you and we've seen mm. over the past 30 40 years financial you crisis mean foreign trigger, capital flight because of nothing that but we, that can happen with the norms because they are not subject but to but less has come in I, and it's also less There are three hot. phases in which we've You're survived because well because less is of coming. that. And how, if you open a floodgate very quickly, mm. and this would be an I, w- I would say how policymakers mm. would argue it. Are you bringing in stable long-term capital that's looking mm. at investing in the country, mm. Mm. or are you bringing in short-term, you know, quick profit-seeking capital? So. It's so, difficult. but I think we've we've ridden the storm quite well through yeah. three of these ones because I think we've been a mm. little bit more prudent, mm. right? Do you think this funnel of money which came into India, edtech, many other sectors in the last decade, when say the cost of borrowing in the West was a fraction of what it what it is now? Maybe yeah. it was one percent. Now it's maybe five and a half percent. How long do you think this winter will continue for? And when you look at Large numbers of companies like SoftBank and uh, uh, Temasek and all these big guys, Tiger Global, they all seem to be down so much. What do you think will incentivize the fresh risk chasing money to come into India and in turn into edtech? So I think a lot of that money came in actually mm. came in from the east coast, but went mm. to the west coast guys mm. because mm. most of the money got spent mm. on advertising and, and yeah. spending out of the west coast guys mm. in America. So yeah. actually, some sense of in and out happened there. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't put Temasek and SoftBank and Tiger all in the same bracket. One mm. is a sovereign fund. Yeah. One mm. is a lot mm. more individually thing. run. Mm. One is a, got a great track record. Mm. No stand sense mm. of judgment on actually any. Actually, not them. Temasek. I'm talking about Tiger and Soft. yeah, Tiger, SoftBank, whatever else. See, I think. It's a little bit like if I'm if I gave you this example if I want to do eight risk because the two that I want to win I win at forty x. Mm. That's a point of view, and if you want to play that, you will have good years and you'll have bad years. You may have good five years, 
and 10 bad years. Mm. But in eventually, if you're looking at that 20x, 30x, 40x, they may want to do exactly what they want to do. Mm. And today, a lot of these people are burnt in the public markets, not in mm. the private markets. But the mm. question of yours was a lot more in the private market mm-hmm. than the public market. Mm-hmm. So we have to keep that in mind also. There's nothing listed really, right, in India in the tech sector? No, no, no. But the, 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 mm. the mindset of these mm. and the winter is set in because mm. in the public markets, they've lost more money, much less than they've lost in the private market. Mm. And that has created this perceived oh, vocabulary. So this is not just about ed tech. This is about yeah. tech yeah, in general. Sort of, mm. I think what will also happen is that um, even even when the winter mm. is over, the the disciplined ways the disciplined ways of building companies will come back, mm. and people will start building higher valued companies with with much less capital. But we'll, why do we classify winter with the inflow versus the winter? Will be if the market is closed down, mm. the prospects of consumer spending mm. is slowed down. That would be a snowstorm. Sorry? That would be like a snowstorm. No, but storm. Yeah, that would be everything. Yeah. But, but the thing is, for a lot of young people... So I don't know why at the starting gate, everyone's mm. calling in the winter just because mm. some really people are giving them... No, no, but... The situation people, in people, Bangalore people, is people, quite bad in the startup ecosystem. No, no, but what you guys uh, are not understanding Maybe in this skyscraper. Yeah. No, no. No, no it, it is, but it also, mm. compared it to 2019... Mm. It's probably not nearly as bad. It's just compared to 21. Mm. No, see, a lot of people who want to start up, the first check that they get is will be from like an angel fund or an institutional yeah. fund. Or yeah. not. Mm. The 9 out of 10 people that we're talking about don't get a check to start. But that doesn't mean they don't start. Mm. And I think we should be just a little yeah. bit realistic about that thought process. So you are saying that it is possible to build a fairly large tech company without raising capital. I think in media, one did it for eight years without raising mm. one rupee. And, I mean, and, and we have with, zero, zero <laughs> as an example. with but, zero dha. Yeah. But, but it, what, what, it, yeah, exactly. What, but, but 90% of the large tech companies, and especially I'm talking about tech, where you have to have some sort of an advantage to scale fast or speed fast. I think venture capital plays what a huge role. What is fast? The subjective definition Created by velocity, the velocity set by some other people. But on ours their own. is not fast. I've been doing the same yeah. job I do today for 19 years, full time trading investing. And people are losing the thing that it yeah. takes. It time. takes time. It takes time. It takes time. You lose the value if it takes time. You're in trouble. Like exact same job, same schedule, same routine, everything same for 19 years. Yeah, even big tech took time. Mm-hmm. And you know, one of the things I look at big tech, I look at Google or Facebook. The founders still own large shares. Oh. Yeah. Because they didn't dilute the way current founders are diluting. It's mm. crazy. You're, it's you're, not you're, like you're you know where at Series E you're at nine percent. Mm. Okay, guys. Again, mindful of eight minutes or whatever we have left. Maybe take the last couple of minutes each to say what have you learned that you wish you knew before starting Upgrad, before starting an academy, before everything Jay has done in the realm of education, something for people starting off today to watch out for. And if you had two choices to change about education overall, what would they be? So, I think um, I've said this before and I'll say it again. We don't have the liberty for hindsight. Mm. And I think anyone starting up needs to understand that, that if the formula is one about hindsight, Mm. it doesn't happen that Mm. way. If in 1995 mm. I did this, mm. this, and this, I would have been a 10x value of my mm. media company. Doesn't I could have been bankrupt mm. because five other things would have happened mm. there. So to me, it is a learning process. It's mm. an iterative process. Mm. And if you look at it always fast forward and mm. forward mm. versus hindsight, you're going to be able to actually better your odds of success. Mm. So for anyone who's looking for what would I do in the rear view mirror, mm. the 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 possibility is that you'll do a lot more wrong if you keep looking in the rearview mirror. Mm. One thing I gather from you a lot is you take a certain amount of pride in the wrong that you have done and you speak about it. Yeah. I think, ha- so in a way, what you're also saying is not having an ego about the mistakes you have made is very important. But we don't talk about it that often. Uh-huh. And we should talk about it. Yeah. I'm not saying we need to bang the table about it, but we do need to talk about it. And I think part of what we are thawing the mm. icebergs here mm. of the ne- not the next thousand entrepreneurs, but the next million entrepreneurs mm. are going to come if you thaw the iceberg, mm. not throw in a couple of ice cubes. Mm. 
Nice, nice. And two things you would like to change about education overall? Two specific things. What needs to change? What will likely change? Okay, give me one that needs to I change. I think there is a one certain like level of, of structure in the formal education space, mm. which we need to respect. Mm. Because if we go disrupting that, it's mm. not going to be there. We need to layer it, we need to augment it. Mm. We need to have a much more rounded element to that, mm. that thought process. Mm. That'll make a world of a difference because mm. it'll get people at a much younger age to be a lot more aware. Mm -hmm. And second, I think in education, whether we like it or not, there is the haves and the haves not. Mm. And I emotionally, Mm -hmm. and passionately believe that if we fix the have-nots a little mm -hmm. bit more disproportionately, mm -hmm. we'll all be in a different marketplace. So for me, at this stage in my life, market making and opening mm -hmm. up at scale is quite an obsession. Mm -hmm. So I think those are two macro points for me. Jay? So for me, two themes. One is theme at a system level, and one is at an individual level. At a system level, I think, I agree with Ronnie, don't break parts of what is mm -hmm. traditional. Simply widen the number of people that can access what is traditional. For me, a far bigger problem is not necessarily the quality of the education. I'm coming from outside the tech sector, so it's easier for me to say mm -hmm. that because I'm uh, not, you know, biased towards uh, necessarily thinking the opposite way. Maybe I'm wrong. And widen just giving everybody more, making it meritocratic and then allowing merit mm -hmm. to take course. The challenge right now is that most people struggle to get access to basics that make even access to education and then the brand name kind of spiral. So that for me is the individual side, uh, the system side. At an individual side, it's much more, again, the theme we've touched on, learning from people, not learning from courses and learning uh, mm -hmm. from books. I think learning from people is it's harder to surround yourself, but at some level we make decisions mm. of who we surround ourselves mm. with. And those are semi-conscious at least. I know some people have less of a choice in mm -hmm. that. And I think that that to me is lifelong learning after the age of, at the latest 30, but for most people 23 or 24 is learning from people. Yeah. Got it? Can you repeat the question? One thing you've learned in your journey in the journey around education that you would like to share so the new budding entrepreneurs can keep that in mind. Second part of the question, if you could change arbitrarily one, one very fundamental first principles kind of thing about education, what would you change? So I'll start with the second one first. Mm -hmm. What I would like to change is that even today, I think uh, everybody there is a lot more focus on content and education, etc. Uh, I like to believe that technologists are not coming in the sector. I like to believe that the way uh, a Duolingo has solved a problem, where it's a completely uh, computer-generated program or a game teaching people, and obviously there is humor intervention that has gone into it, uh, or there is Roblox where every uh, third kid is using in US like uh, or playing a game on Roblox. Mm. I think people are not building enough technology stuff. So one thing I would like to change is that I would request entrepreneurs that education is a big sector. Uh, don't just be stuck in fintech. Uh, look beyond fintech. Every other founder I meet is, I'm doing fintech this, I'm doing fintech that. Yes, fintech is a big market. Yeah, fintech is fun. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, fintech is a big market, but um, there are other sectors also where um, a large part of uh, large companies will be created. Mm -hmm. The and, and 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 second thing which I have a huge problem with is that, uh, uh, and this is nothing to do with that tech. This is more. Uh, I, I think the ambition of founders in India is very low. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I see some co-founders exiting after taking some minor secondary. I see. Uh, people getting satisfied very less, but let's say if you if you if you look at a, a Dipinder of a Zomato or Bhavesh of Anola, and the kind of aspirations they have for their act two, amazing aspirations. So what what we also like we want super duper ambitious people and technology people to uh, also come to edtech and. Uh, be ambitious in general. So, um, and 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 more than education. See, I believe that yes, peer-to-peer -peer learning and people learning from people is good. 
uh, but my view is which is completely different i i don't think that's practical i don't think that's what will scale duolingo now has 60 million meus there is no other person on the app um, there are 8 million paid users this is from their last earnings report stock is trading at 15x revenue 6 billion dollar company no human is involved no social experience there is gamification and a computer teaching you and i think lifelong learning though theoretically sounds good i don't think anybody wants to you have to solve for motivation in an ideal scenario i yes people should do lifelong learning but they don't so how do we solve for motivation that you know you study psychology for learning and not because you want to crack these examinations so i think these are the few uh, thoughts that i have but and one last prediction i would like to make is that we don't realize that how much ai will change education i think every most of the stuff that we discussed today would look irrelevant one year from now and we don't realize that 5 years from now every household will have a robot mm -hmm. like personal computers changed everything if you look at the latest product that ring has introduced the doorbell cam now ring has a drone which can while you are away access your entire home and what tesla bot is doing i think we are maybe 3 or 4 or 5 years away where every household in the world especially starting with the uh, uh people who can afford it will have a robot so i think that will also change a lot of things super my thing i can paint a optimistic picture or a very dystopian one i'm going to pick the latter uh i feel like the modern construct of a family husband wife child school, or non or non child or non child is not is not the best to fester education in the manner that i would dream for it to be i think if you go back in time before organized religion and many other things each kid learned from the community and he fixated upon what skill set he might like in the community what he would like to inculcate i feel the modern notion of a family we tell our kids what religion to follow we tell our kids what it is okay to study maybe not consciously but subconsciously uh i don't know how this will work but going back to a world where the mimetic influences of the world are lesser on the child and the child is allowed an environment to be more organic about the learning choices he makes is something that should change about education make sense yeah well put yeah done so thank you everyone thank you. and uh look forward to seeing you guys next time thank you guys for coming thank, thank you. you hi i'm nikhil kamath i'd love to know what you thought of the episode uh, comment like and subscribe and thank you for watching